the data center for Russian and Eurasian studies, uh, the, the program of Central Asia and the Imperial program. And I have a uh, uh, director of Imperial program, um, Kelly O'Neill, uh, Anne Sikha, but she's here. <laughs> and uh, my name is Nargis Kasiano, and I'm director of the program on, uh, on Central Asia. Uh, we are very fortunate um, today to have with us uh, Dr. Nicola Pianciola. Uh, Dr. Pianciola is Associate Professor of History at the University of Padua, Italy. And uh, I'm also happy to know that he was a postdoc fellow here at the Davis Center in 2005-2006. Uh, uh, he has published works on the Great Famine in Kazakhstan, um, of the 1930s on Tsarist policies in Central Asia and post-migration and in Eurasia. Uh, prior to his current position, he taught at Ling Lingnan University, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, okay. 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 Uh, University in Hong Kong and also Nazarbayev University in Astana. This one I know how to pronounce. <laughs> um, and on the topic of the talk, he recently published Opium Regimes of Imperial Collapse, the Russian Far East during the Civil War, 1917, 1922, uh, in Ab Imperio. Uh, and illegal markets and the formation of a Central Asian borderland, the Turkestan Sijan Opium Trade, 1881, 1917, in modern Asian um, studies. So, Nicolò, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, was, it is great to come back here. Students look much younger now. <laughs> but um, OK, so um, this is an ongoing research, um, and it's comparative research, as you will uh, see, although uh, I think I will focus more on the on the Russian Far East uh, uh, today. So let me start from an episode I found uh, in a document from the archives in, in Vladivostok. In June 1915, the Tsar signed into law the prohibition of cultivating opium in the Russian Far East. First World War. The law established that anyone caught cultivating opium poppy would be sentenced to jail time and heavy fines. However, reports from summer 1915 showed not only that the opium harvesting was going on undisturbed. A report claimed that in 1915, in the lands along the Usuri River, which was, of course, um, the, the, the border between uh, uh, China and, and, um, and, uh, and the Tsarist Empire, land cultivated with opium poppy was equivalent in surface with the land cultivated with all kinds of grain, i.e. in the entire province, the fields were half opium poppy, half grain. The officers touring the countryside and checking whether the prohibition was being implemented, discovered that the village of Rakovka, in the village of Rakovka, the land of the church land parcel, Tserkovni Nadiel, was cultivated with opium poppy by Chinese peasants who rented the fields from the local church. The officers recommended that the poppy would be destroyed, then left. They returned a year later after the harvest to check whether poppies had been eradicated. The land of the church, 35 Disiapini, or 38.2 hectares, was still cultivated with poppy and the very same Chinese peasants still worked for the local church. To the officers asking why the land had not been cleared of the opium poppies, the Orthodox priest of Rakovka explained that the village had a wooden church by renting the church land parcel to Chinese peasants to produce opium, eventually the village will get enough money to build a stone church. In 1916, the cultivated surface to opium in the Usuri region even increased, despite the fact that the governor general had issued new severe dispositions ordering the arrest of peasants sowing poppies. As a report put it, both the population and the officers who should have implemented these dispositions quote, treat the issue with indifference and apparently do not take any measure to implement the law of 7th of June, 1915, that prohibits renting out land for poppy cultivation, unquote. So this episode um, points at some of the main questions of my ongoing research about migration and trade in the Sino-Russian borderlands. The research compares the borderland between um, Xinjiang and Turkestan, and the area between the Russian Far East and Manchuria. This, of course, at the area when the Qing Empire still controlled uh, those areas. It focuses primarily on the opium trade and explores how the actions of the people inhabiting the, borderland, the borderlands created them as unified spaces, despite the fact that the late 19th and early 20th century was a period in which these regions were subject to fragmented and unstable sovereignties. 
One question is how the study of transimperial regions from below can help us to take into account the impact of the millions that made use of porous state borders. The research aims to position the later Tsarist Empire and the early Soviet Union in the global opium trade and to reconstruct Tsarist and Soviet policies related to the production and trade of this global commodity. Explaining why policies in the Russian Far East were so different from those followed in Central Asia. So the Russian conquest of the Pacific Far Eastern territories in the wake of the Second Opium War, which ended in 1860, did not lead to a stable spatial order, i.e. a configuration of economic and political hierarchies that persisted in the medium term. In Northeast Asia, the Tsarist Empire took advantage of the Qing defeat to annex vast territories. This eventually prompted more aggressive expansionist policy by Japan, which for the first time had one of the European powers controlling a vast territory contiguous to the archipelago. It also brought about the Qing reaction that led to governance reforms and opened Manchuria to agricultural colonization. This shift had a geoeconomic component as much as geopolitical one. In the period between the 1890s and World War I, Northeast Asia was locked, locked in by a wave of globalization of production and trade. Soybeans from Manchuria became a global commodity. The Russian Far East was connected in different ways to both the other regions of Northeast Asia and to global markets. The newly built Vladivostok port worked primarily as an export node for Manchurian production. The Russian Far Eastern territory largely depended on China for its consumption. About 75% of the grain consumed in the territory was imported from Manchuria. It is therefore useful on, on the one hand to think about the Russian uh, Far East together with China's three Northeast provinces, Fengtian, uh, Jilin, uh, Heilongjiang, as a unitary object of historical analysis. We can call the transimperial region with the uh, river Amur, Heilongjiang, at its center, Amuria, following historian Loretta Kim. This transimperial region is one in which sovereignties overlapped, intertwined, and remained ambiguous between the late 1890s, when the Tsarist uh, uh, Empire received the concession to build the Chinese Eastern Railway, which was completed in 1903, and it carved out a strip of territory taken from Qing sovereignty in the early 1930s. First, by this happened by Russian, uh, because of Russian and Japanese expansion into Qing territory, and then by the collapse of the Qing and Tsarist empires, the creation of warlord regimes and precarious and geographically limited military political powers during the uh, post-Tsarist civil war, often controlled by Japan, or the Bolsheviks, the so-called Far Eastern Republic during the civil war until the early, very early 1920s. Lauren Benton has argued that studying the history of imperial formations between the 15th and 19th centuries, instead of using the concept of borderlands, it is more fruitful to speak of legal regimes of quasi-sovereignty that unfold with the formation of corridors and enclaves with, within imperial spheres of influence. Within early 20th century Amuria, however, the concept of borderland can still help us because the state border between Russia and China, which corresponded and corresponds to the Amur and Usuri rivers, had an impact on local uh, society. Of course, there is also the Argun River further west, which has been uh, so well studied by Soren, uh, Soren Urbanski um, in, a, in, a local, in a recent, uh, in a recent, recent book. So on the one hand, the border was porous. It could be crossed conveniently from both sides of the border. There was hectic smuggling of liquor from China to Russia and of opium in the opposite direction. On the other hand, however, the state border, even if it did not foreclose two territories, one from the other, um, did have an impact on the society that it crossed. The border delimited areas that had different governance settings, no matter how weak, Moreover, the border created arbitrage economies. For the re this reason, it was used by the population, for instance, by positioning their productive and marketing activities on the two different sides of the border. So one of the um, specificity of Northeast Asia is that it, it was possibly the only area of Asia 
that was the object of three partially overlapping settler colonial projects in the period 1858-1945, Russian, Chinese, and Japanese, with the Koreans playing the role of auxiliary, auxiliary settlers for both the Russians and especially the Japanese project. The development of transport infrastructures could help all three these settler colonial projects. Therefore, there was a degree of symbiosis, not just competition or interaction among the three. So agricultural settlement on Russian territory was connected with opium production in, uh, um, in one major way. The, uh, and this, is, this can def be defined as symbiotic colonization between Chinese or Korean poppy growers who rented Cossack or Russian land in this case, there was a mutual benefit. Cossacks and Russian peasants could raise very high rents and were freed from the need of cultivating their own land. For Chinese and Korean peasants, making use of the newly created porous border and of the presence of Cossacks and peasants on the other side had its own rationale. In Manchuria, either the Qing state did raise taxes on opium or in other areas, it was not strong enough to defend the peasants from the Hong Hudze, literally <clears throat> red beards, bandits, who preyed on the population. <clears throat> so paying a rent to work on Cossack land was an effective way to acquire protection against borderland banditry. Moreover, the Russian administration, unlike the Qing one, was in denial of the existence of opium cultivation and imposed no taxes. Even if on Tsar's territory, the Chinese remained in a second class status limbo, their poppy cultivation and opium trade business had more chances to succeed by making use of the border and moving north or east in the case of the Usuri than to remaining in Manchuria. The production and export of opium in the Tsarist empire remained in a legal limbo. In 1881, the Treaty of St. Petersburg put an end to the Ili crisis between the Tsarist and Qing empires in Central Asia. The treaty outlaw, outlaw cross-border opium trade, both import into Turkestan and export from the region into Xinjiang. Shortly thereafter, however, a December 1881 regulation regarding customs in Central Asia, Tsarist regulation, specified that the import of drugs was outlawed, while no reference to export was made. Moreover, no laws or administrative regulations prohibited poppy cultivation and opium production on Tsarist land. So the interpretation of the customs regulations made by successive military governors in the Central Asian borderlands was that since no mention was made of a ban on exporting opium, its export could be considered legal. For diplomatic reasons, though, no Russian colonial official made this point publicly. Officially, the main regulations regarding cross-border opium trade remain those included in the St. Petersburg Treaty. Therefore, the legality of opium export remain in a gray area. These ambiguous regulations were also applied in the Russian Far East. At the end of the 19th century, the Tsarist administration in the Far East was more worried about the uh, psychoactive substances that we uh, then with other about other psychoactive substances than with opium, and specifically by the flow of Chinese liquor by Zhou, uh, called by the Russians Hanshina, that uh, flooded the Russian Far East through smuggling from from China. Um, and opium was not uh, uh, not not seen as a, as a potential danger or a problem because um, the local governors. Were, uh, were writing to St. Petersburg that in any case, only the local population, only Chinese and Koreans smoke it. So it's not, it's not a problem. And instead they were encouraging the legalization of opium um, to, to raise some, some, some uh, uh, economic resources. The years between 1900 and 1906, um, so, so these are Chinese uh, workers on the, um, Chinese Eastern Railway, um, and this is the situation after the after the uh, Sino-Japanese, the Russian-Japanese War. So the first six years of the 20th century saw vast military operations in the region that made cross-border trade more difficult. 
The Thais occupation of large areas in Manchuria in the wake of the so-called Boxer Uprising involved military confrontations with the Qing army and expulsions and killings of thousands of Chinese and Manchus from Tsarist territories. Tsarist occupation of Manchuria eventually led to the war with Japan in 1904 and 1905. During the war, both armies tried to use the local bandits to their advantage as spies or in cavalry units. The Japanese were apparently more successful, but the Tsarist command also worked with them. The withdrawal of the occupying armies after the war was only completed in 1907. A significant increase in cross-border opium trade in Northeast Asia occurred after the new Qing policy aimed at uh, uh, extirpating uh, opium production and trade was implemented in, uh, in, in China. So this is a border stone. Uh, so this is the, the very small um, area of the border, which is actually a land border south of the, the, the southernmost uh, uh, section of the border between um, then the then Qing Empire and, and Russia. This is the Amur River Heilanjiang. And so uh, it was easily uh, crossed. And these are Cossacks, those who rented land to uh, Chinese and Koreans. I love this uh, photograph because it's the only photograph I know, uh, historical photograph where the name of dogs is recorded, even if they are not looking at the camera. This is a wonderful photo of Koreans in St. Petersburg. So let me, um, so uh, going back to the Qing policies, um, so uh, the Guangxu Emperor's edict of September 1906 prohibited the, the smoking and import into China of opium. The following year, Britain and China signed the so-called 10 Years Agreement, which set a target of 10 years for stopping cultivation and opium use in, in China. The campaign, uh, the opium extirpation campaign, was largely uh, successful in, uh, uh, in China in cutting down opium production, thanks to the energetic efforts by governors of the major production regions, especially in Sichuan, which by itself provided approximately 40% of Chinese opium production at the time. The Anglo-Chinese agreement came into force on 1st of January 1908. Thing opium prohibition was implemented in Manchuria too. This led to a substantial increase of profitability of renting out land for opium in the Russian Far East and therefore was a further incentive for Chinese peasants to cross the border. In early 1911, uh, Zhao Arshun became viceroy of the three Northeast provinces. Up to that point, Zhao had been the most effective opium eradicator among Qing administrators. Also after the fall of the Qing dynasty and Zhao's departure in 1912, opium production did not increase again until after the death of Yuan Shikai in 1916 and the crumbling of China into World of this. In the Russian Far East in 1913, Usuri and Amur Cossacks and Russian peasants were able to rent out land at astonishingly high prices of up to 300 rubles per desiatina per year, 100 times the average rent price for land in the territory of the Don Cossack host or the Transbaikal Cossack host. There was no ethnic, gender, or generational border that could not be crossed by the need of labor during the opium harvest. Chinese and Korean peasants who rented land from the Russians would in their turn hire Russian women and girls as young as 12 years old for the harvest. It is impossible not to see a common agency by Cossacks, Russian peasants, and Chinese and Korean migrants in opium cultivation on Russian territory. Cossack and Russian, Cossacks and uh, Russian peasants preferred renting their land to poppy growers as the rent that could be raised from land producing other crops was much, much lower. Seen from the tenant's perspective, such a sky-high land rent price locked the Chinese and Koreans into poppy cultivation opium smuggling as it was impossible to pay the high rent with other crops. Controls of the state borders had not much improved. This was reflected in customs policy. The empire's customs was positioned on the border between Manchuria and the Transbaikal Oblast, along the border, uh, whereas along the border between Manchuria and the Primorsky Krai, until 1913, there was a strip of territory officially open to trade, not subject to any customs duties. So basically, there was a free trade uh, between the Russian Far East and Manchuria. Um, so a report 
written in 1910, claimed that foreign subjects often traveled on the Chinese Eastern Railroad, but nobody checked their documents on the state border. The report continued, quote, not long ago, there was the case of a Japanese Navy officer who passed through Pagranichnaya Station, which is this place here, where the border was not even a uh, sign on, 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 on the land. Um, it put made for uniform, and apparently nobody among the workers of the railway administration, nor any gendarme in the station, felt the need to check whether he had the right to enter Russian territory, unquote. And this was the situation on the supposedly most controlled crossing point at the entire border. However, this lack of border control was not so much related to inability to do so, at least at the points where the border areas were most populated, uh, so in correspondence to uh, towns or cities on the other side of, of rivers, or at the point of railroad crossing. This is demonstrated by the fact that when a plague epidemic the famous Manchuria plague um, in the late uh, 1910, uh, at the end of 1910 and early 1911. At this point, this moment, the Tsarist administration effectively prevented the Chinese population from crossing the border to cities on the Russian shore of the rivers, for instance, in Blagaviations, and at railroad crossing points. The Japanese, uh, at the same time, banned the sale of tickets to Qing subjects on the South Manchuria Railway to limit contagion. So the fact that the border was so poorly guarded up to that time was instead related to the fact that Manchuria, uh, by then only the northern, northern Manchuria, as you can see from the map I showed before, um, after the division of the region into sphere of influence between the Tsarist Empire and Japan, uh, was considered an area over which Tsarist sovereignty or quasi-sovereignty was projected in the future. I use again this general term that uh, Lauren Benton describes to the conjuries of, quote, arrangements of shared or limited sovereignty, including semi-sovereignty, paramountcy, protectorates, and indirect rule, unquote. Also because already a decade earlier, in 1898, a Tsarist administrator with experience in Central Asia, Nikolai Gradyekov, sent a report to the Ministry of War, then headed by Kuropatkin, in which he roughly wrote, I'm, I'm summarizing here, soon the Qing Empire will collapse. It's very weak, will collapse. What we must do is to take a member of the Manchu imperial family and put him on the throne of a newly created Manchurian protectorate, just as we did in Hiva and Bukhara in Central Asia. Of course, eventually, a different empire would implement almost to the letter this project of quasi-imperial sovereignty during the 1930s. So the porosity of the border at different periods was increased or preserved, both by the symbiosis of interest between migrant property growers and settler colonists who rented land, land to them, and by the power projection of the imperial administration, particularly the military. We can speak of a gray border. It was consciously held in a condition of ambiguity with respect to its openness or closure. The perception of Manchurian territory as infested by Hong Hu's bandits is also related to the issue of quasi-sovereignty, this time by a Qing administration that could not maintain control of its military in this period. Um, a substantial, not everywhere, but in this region, a substantial portion of the Hong Huzi were Chinese soldiers from Qing garrisons in the region who deserted due to poor living conditions, soldiers were barely fed. According to a 1908 Tsarist intelligence report, about half of the Qing soldiers stationed, stationed in the three Manchurian provinces had left the ranks, i.e. they had deserted or had been discharged. In most cases, regular Qing soldiers did not wear a uniform, which made them undistinguishable from Hong Hu In May 1908, for example, Thai soldiers arrested five Chinese soldiers who were on patrol on the trail of a group of bandits because the Chinese had no uniform and therefore the Russians had mistaken them for bandits. Around the same time, um, the Thai administration sent six soldiers and one officer in search of one of their horses that had been stolen. At one point, the group of Russians ran into 60 armed Chinese, apparently soldiers without uniforms, who were camped near a small group of farmhouses. 
The Chinese invited them to the farmhouse and offered them tea. The Russian soldiers drank tea, thanked them, and left. In the next village, the frightened Chinese villagers explained to them that those were not soldiers at all, but a fearsome band of Hongzhu. So let's go back to opium. Around 1910, I don't have time here to um, give you a, a contextualization of opium policies in East Asia. Probably most of you will be uh, familiar with, with that, but I can do that in the Q&A if it's, something is not clear. But uh, around 1910, the changed international public discourse about opium, a press campaign in Russia about the supposed fact that Russians were becoming opium smokers in the Far East and Central Asia, the radical policy change in the Qing Empire, that I already mentioned, and the new policies of exclusion against Chinese workers in the Russian Far East led to the first attempts to limit opium poppy cultivation in the Far East starting in 1910. For Russian Prime Minister Stalipin, the international relation aspect was probably paramount. He tried to have a law passed prohibiting opium poppy cultivation shortly before being assassinated in 1911. The administration in the Russian Far East instead saw the issue as accessory to the new anti-Chinese policy in the territory. The law of the 21st of June 1910 prohibited the leasing of state land to foreigners, quote unquote, the engagement of foreign contractors for state-funded work, and the hiring of foreign workers in government projects. I'm quoting here from um, from Sue's uh, um, article on, on this. However, the law allowed for the employment of foreigners in exceptional cases, thereby permitting seasonal employment. So in the spirit of the law, as ministers uh, said, debating the, draft, uh, uh, the drafting of the law, uh, if the spirit of the law was to prevent Chinese and Korean immigration, its eventual formulation allowed the continuing opium poppy cultivation in the Russian Far East. However, in this period, uh, those Chinese and Koreans In this period, those Chinese and Koreans um, who did not rent land from Cossacks or Russian peasants, but instead squatted on state land and produced opium, were systematically evicted. So these are uh, mugshots of, of uh, people expelled from, from the Russian Far East. So the administration was performing, um, was creating documents showing their efficiency, whereas the border remained the course nonetheless. Uh, so these were people who mostly did not rent land from Cossacks or Russian peasants, but instead squatted on state land and produced opium. And they were systematically evicted under the last Tsarist Priamur governor general, Nikolai Gandatti, who became governor general in January 1911 until March of 1917, also with the help of the famous explorer Vladimir Arsenyev. You can, you can see here Arsenyev. So he was leading on these secret missions uh, in the in Far East uh, um, part of the of, its, of his task was to uh, evict uh, squatters. This is a photo of uh, a house uh, um, uh, where, where opium was stored by, by a, a Chinese squatter on, on, Russian, uh, on Russian land in the Far East, in the Usuri region. And this was, of course, as you can see, was being burned by, by the Arsenic detachment. Um, so the first real attempt at the prohibiting opium happened during World War I, and it failed miserably, as we saw at the beginning. During the war, the demand for opium increased manifold in the Tsarist Empire because of the millions of wounded soldiers who needed morphine as a painkiller. Already in autumn 1914, the Tsarist government was looking for opium wherever possible. Minister of Agriculture Alexander Krivashein requested the Far East administration to send as soon as possible whatever quantity of opium it was possible to find. So a startled of the Nikolai Gandatti, the governor general, um, ordered the requisitions of opium from illegal opium dens, which was, there were, was plenty of them in all uh, Russian cities. And they, they were uh, feeding uh, 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 a corruption economy uh, with bribes, very fat bribes being paid uh, to, the, to the police uh, in, uh, uh, in the Russian Paris. Um, so between October 1914 and 1917, Gondati probably sent up to one metric ton of opium to Petrograd. A requisition by from from uh, open debt. Um, on the seventh of June, nineteen fifteen, the Tsar signed into law the prohibition of cultivating opium, and the prohibition was contemporary to the de facto suspension of the nineteen ten law against the Chinese and Korean immigration. The huge need of labor to make up for the workers and peasants mobilized in the army led to a new wave of especially Chinese migrant labor in the Tsarist Empire, 
50,000 were recruited to work in the maritime province in the Far East, and at least 150,000 were sent to European Russia. In 1916, the government created the first Tsarist state opium monopoly and concentrated all legal Tsarist opium production in Central Asia. In the Similyeche region, opium there was mostly cultivated by Karanchis uh, and the Dungans, Pei, but also Slavic peasants, Kyrgyz, and Kazakhs took advantage of the cross-border opium economy. Cultivation was concentrated mainly in the Karakol district and to a lesser extent in the Jharkhand area, which is Karakol now is in Kyrgyzstan and Jharkhand is in Kazakhstan. This is an important factor in explaining why the 1916 uprising in Central Asia was incomparably more violent in the Karakol district than in any other area of Central Asia and the Kazakh steppe against Russian and Ukrainian settlers. 87% of all Russian and Ukrainian settlers in the entirety of Central Asia was killed in the tiny Karakol district. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's clear that this is also linked to the to the fact that precisely in 1916, the Tsarist Empire tried to, uh, to, to, to close the border to, um, to end this cross-border economy. After the collapse of the Tsarist Empire, relations between Cossacks and the Chinese population in the Far East continued along the lines of the pre-war uh, period. During this, uh, the Civil War, as you uh, know, the Russian Far East was occupied by Allied troops, especially Japan, which sent an expeditionary force of 70,000 soldiers, but also from the United States and Canada. Formerly, the region was administered by semi-independent Russian uh, warlords, mostly Cossacks, supported by the Japanese. The Chinese government also sent troops, uh, about 4,000 soldiers, and tried to take back partial control over the rivers, the right of navigating the Amur, for instance, but without much success. In 1920, so this was the situation, if you can see it. In 1920, in Vladivostok, a government headed by members of the educated groups and professionals of the city and propped up by Japanese military power, set up an opium state monopoly. This was the first time that opium was officially legalized in the Russian Far East, even if the monopoly was, was a fiction. But uh, uh, in, in the sense that it was impossible for them, of course, to, to control the entire market of opium. Um, the entire state opium reserve Reserves were collected in the Vladivostok branch of the Siberian, of the Siberian um, Commercial Bank, where they were analyzed for morphine, con morphine content and exchanged for uh, uh, money. The Japanese military presence in the region was the biggest obstacle to a consolidation of Bolshevik power in the Russian Far East after the end of the Civil War elsewhere on former Tsarist territories. The, Bolshevik, uh, the Bolsheviks conquered Black Aviation in February 1920. In April 1920, the Far Eastern Republic, under the authority of a socialist coalition government, was established as a transitional buffer quasi-state. The Japanese army eventually withdrew uh, from Russian territory in October 1922. So this was the, the government, the, the uh, head of the, head of the, the leadership of the government of Vladivostok uh, that uh, legalized opium uh, for, a, for a short time, because it existed for a short time. This was basically a, a Japanese puppet government. So this was the, the first time in which uh, the, the Japanese um, create, um, I mean, legalized opium uh, uh, production in a, in a puppet government on the on on on, uh, on the Asian mainland, uh, of course, they already legalized that in the um, in the quantum leasehold uh, in uh, in uh, Daire. So in the 1920s, um, so during Soviet times now, while in Central Asia, the Soviet government created a new state monopoly, allegedly only for pharmaceutical production. In the Russian Far East, the legal prohibition. And and de facto widespread production resumed. Uh, in October 1924, the government created a state company, ACOSPO, a Russian acron acronym for Joint Stock Company for the Collection and Processing of Opium, even if all the stocks were owned by different state institutions, uh, including the Kazakh and Kyrgyz republics. In autumn 1924, this state company started to collect opium in the Kazakh and Kyrgyz republics. In 1926, the Soviet government made up with Spol the only legitimate opium purchaser in the USSR. So technically it was a monopsony, 
had extended its uh, monopsony of opium over the entire Soviet territory. That year, Akospo controlled amounts of opium above the yearly needs of the Soviet pharmaceutical industry. Therefore, starting from 1926, Akospo was looking for foreign markets to sell opium abroad, mainly in Europe. So agreements were signed with, uh, with companies in Germany, Italy, France, the uh, Czechoslovakia. But Akospo man managers, of course, knew that the main market in the world was in East Asia, above all in China. Uh, meanwhile, in the Far East, trade relations in the early 1920s in the Russian Far East were much more intense with Manchuria and Japan than with Soviet Russia. The yen and the US dollars uh, were the only currencies accepted in everyday transactions. It was not until the mid-1920s, after the currency reform that stabilized ruble, that taxes were required to be paid in rubles. So opium production in the Russian Far East was legally prohibited, but informally tolerated. It is likely that this was a case of strategic ambiguity linked to the role that opium trade had in the Far East economy. An episode um, from 1925 illustrates the, the gray character of the opium economy in the region. This story comes from the Spassky Uyezd in the Primorsky Krai, bordering with China and with Lake Anka. This is Spassky Uyezd, and this is the border with, with, uh, with China. Um, so at this point, um, opium was prohibited. And uh, in 1925, um, higher administrative levels rejected the district, UIES, the budget for the economic year. And so the UIES administration came up with a plan. Uh, the KPU, the Procuratura, and the police were involved in this plan. So the U.S. administration would rent out 1,600 desiatini, 1,600 of state land for poppy cultivation at very high prices, up to 100 rubles for each desiatina per year. But since poppy cultivation was illegal, the rent would be collected from cultivators in the form of a fine for cultivating poppy. The revenue collected would be itemized in the local budget as other revenues, while the land rented out for poppy cultivation will be described in official documents as cultivated with orchards if within the towns or other crops if outside. The open campaign was coordinated in the Wies by a special Troika. The Troika members were, were a member of the presidium of the Wies, the executive committee, the head of the police, militia, and the head of the Wies, the GPU. After the harvest, part of the opium would be kept by the peasants and sold autonomously. Part instead would be given to the administration. This informal state opium would be sold to two Chinese entrepreneurs who run illegal opium dens in Vladivostok. They would pay to the U.S. executive committee fixed price of three rubles for each pound of opium. The Troika distributed sample agreement blanks across the U.S. to be signed by the peasants and instructions about how and when to collect the fine slash tax from the cultivators. Since the peasants were afraid of the risks connected with cultivating poppy, the UIA administration sent envoys in the countryside to convince them that poppy cultivation starting from 1925 would not be punished by the OGPU and Procuratura. For instance, the aide of the Spassky police, uh, Astrovsky, summoned the startled Korean peasants of the book uh, Prakovsky Volest in a field and steered them up to sow poppy. Shortly thereafter, the regional administration of the Russian Far East suppressed this scheme. The Procuratura sentenced the head of the UIES and the members of the Opium Troika to jail time, but not the lower level administrators. Another example, and a more interesting one, I think, uh, of the conflicts between different state institutions due to the great character of the opium economy in the region is the clash between OGPU and Dacospo, Agospo, the, the opium state company, over the legalization of opium production in the Russian Far East. So despite the legal monopoly of the entire in the entire Soviet Union, in 1926, Agospo activities were de facto limited to the Kazakh and Kyrgyz uh, republics. In 1927, Agospo made preparations to include the Russian Far East in its activities. Advanced plans about the collection of opium in, uh, in the region by Akospo organs were crafted. The company was targeting the Japanese colonial and metropolitan market. Akospo was openly acknowledging the fact that a good part of the opium acquired by the Japanese would be used as leisure drug in China and elsewhere, not just processed by the pharmaceutical industry. Akospo 
already had a commercial agreement with the uh, with the Zaibatsu Japanese uh, Mitsui and planned to export 60 metric tons to Japan in 1929 to be doubled by 1933. However, against Akospo's interests, the Far Eastern administration requested Moscow, Soviet Far Eastern administration, requested Moscow to exempt the Far East from a 1926 opium legalization law, claiming that legalizing opium would have magnified banditry and smuggling, i.e. would have worked as bait for the Home Foods Band. The local administration was, meanwhile, imposing fines on the land cultivated to poppy that he was able to find, almost 6,000 Lissiatini, with, with fines from 100 to 20, uh, 250 rubles per Lissiatina. It is telling that both Ogepeu and uh, Narcom Torg estimated that the entire local production, 70 tons in 1927, ended up being smuggled into China and to a minor extent Korea. In other words, if we take these words literally, it means that the illegal production was not confiscated and destroyed. This implies that what the Commissariat for Trade later called fine, straf, was in reality, again, a tax. In other words, the in informal scheme set up in the Spassky Wiest in 1925, um, two years later, was run by the administration of the Russian Far East crime. Um, so there are numbers about the estimates of, of the money that the administration managed to, uh, to, to, to raise from that, but I spare you these numbers. But the, uh, in, in short, the taxes imposed on, by, by the state were therefore between 10% and 25% of the annual income of the, of the, of the uh, property production, a completely acceptable cost for, for, uh, for cultivators and producers. Um, so, uh, so those taxes, openly called as such at a certain point by the Far East Committee of the Party, had been imposed by the local executive committees. Um, and, uh, and then the Far East Committee of the Party justified the approval of those local taxes for the 1927 harvest with the fact that the Moscow decree on prohibition 1927 had arrived too late. So when sometimes they call it fines, but sometimes they, they call it tax. Um, so in January 1928, the Soviet government reiterated the prohibition of opium cultivation in the Russian uh, Far East. Um, but uh, uh, and but Akospo continued to lobby for for legalization. The Far East Committee of the Party was firmly against the legalization. Um, first, the committee underscored that Akospo would never succeed in registering the up to eighteen thousand estimated poppy growers spread on a huge territory. Um, according to the Far East Executive Committee of the Party, though the most important reason against legalization was that it was impossible to compete with prices from Manchuria, where one kilogram of opium was paid a minimum of 150 rubles, while Akospo was ready to pay a meager 13.5 rubles. The Far Eastern Committee also pointed out that the legalization of opium production and the actual impossibility of taking it under control would have meant a, a strengthening banditry, again, an increasing opium smoking by the Koreans and the Chinese on Russian territory. The Ogepeu put, put up an even stronger resistance to the Akosto plan. The Ogepeu underlined that Akosto had a purely commercial approach to the issue, while the opium trade in the region had clear geopolitical and security implications. The uh, Far Eastern Ogepeu officials um, mocked the Akosto reference to what they called the, quote, Kazakhstan experience, unquote, when the Far East had very different characteristics. Even the physical geography was radically different without any barrier between China and Russia, except easily cross, crossable rivers. So, uh, so at the beginning of 1928, prohibition was reiterated. Uh, but there is archival evidence to suggest that the anti-legalization views of the UGPU and the Russian Far East administration uh, were not only related to the concern to control the unruly border areas, on ad in addition to the evidence I already mentioned. So in 1925, the Ogepeu had requisitioned in Vladivostok as much as 14.3 tons of opium owned partly by a Soviet organization 
involved in trade with Asian countries called Shark, partly by an Armenian merchant. And uh, um, Shark means, of course, um, East in, uh, in Uzbek and Persian. And uh, partly by unspe unspe unspecified Persian merchants. The opium was temporarily stored in Vladivostok custom, uh, customs warehouses, awaiting export to China. So given, uh, given the nationality of the merchants and the involvement of the state-owned shark company, the opium was probably of Persian origin. The UK bill then took possession of this huge mass of opium, claiming that there were irregularities in, in, the, in the documentation for export, shipped it to Moscow in a sealed uh, wagon. The head of... Um, um, uh, of Akospo, by the way, uh, had already argued that the opium to be exported to the Far East should be shipped from Kazakhstan and the Kyrgyz Republic in anonymous crates on which there was no script betraying its contents. And it is clear who, uh, who this, uh, the head of Akospo was afraid of. So a few months later, in 1925, the Vladivostok branch of the state bank, Bos Bank, received 981.2 kilograms of heroin, quote, owned by the Ugepil. Of these, 660 kilograms were sold to the Chosen Bank, which was the central bank of Korea under Japanese colonial rule. It was the bank that issued the Korean yen and exported for a total profit of almost 300,000 rubles or 13.3% of the total tax revenue of the Russian Far East in 1924-1925. Almost the entire sum uh, was deposited in the current account of the Communist Party Bureau for the Russian Far East in the State Bank branch uh, in Khabarovsk, I think. The same bank kept the remaining 320 kilograms of heroin in its vault. So in practice, the Soviet Communist Party in the Russian Far East was also financing itself by exporting heroin to Korea and Manchuria, where the Japanese were controlling and expanding the narcotics market to finance their imperial rule. So the January, in January 1929, the prohibition on opium cultivation was extended for two additional economic years, but increased the international tensions first, border war with China in 1929, the Stalinist uh, Great Term, and the collectivization of agriculture, uh, later made the debate about opium production in the Russian Far East irrelevant about legalization. After collectivization, state monopoly of any agricultural crop was the default configuration, but opium production was still prohibited in the Russian Far East. The entire state opium production was concentrated in the Central Asian Soviet borderlands, especially in the Kyrgyz um, um, Autonomous Republic, who becomes Soviet Republic in 1936. A giant opium, opium producing uh, um, subhose, sub which employed also thousands of seasonal opium growers from Kashgar, was set up on the eastern shores of the Isiku Lake near the town of Karakol. You can see uh, in this here in this map from Google Maps. Um, so basically, it occupied the, this entire peninsula on the on the Karakol. It was called the uh, Suhoi Hrebiet um, subhose. So some concluding remarks. Uh, these are, this is a photo from, from, from that area, uh, from, from Kyrgyzstan, uh, with, um, with Kyrgyz uh, women collecting poppies. And this instead is a, is a photo from, um, from, from the Jarkian area where uh, collective farms, opium producer collective farms were, were set up during collectivization. So to conclude, uh, the spatial and economic separation of the Russian Far East from the other parts of the Soviet Union and its union um, via an unpolished border that did not separate it from Manchuria and Korea created a peculiar governance setting linked to the opium economy in the region. It was also linked to Japan's growing involvement in the global opium and herring trade. Opium and narcotics were sold in the world's largest opium market, China or Japan was extending its power in the interwar period. So the vast cross-border gray market between the Russian Far East and Manchuria could not be controlled or repressed unless a huge amount of violence was exercised against the entire rural population and the border was militarized. This was precisely what, what, was, what was to happen in the 1930s. 
But in the 1920s, economic actors created by the new economic policy, such as uh, the COSPA company, uh, would enter the, the vast gray market and legalize only part of it in, in Central Asia. So therefore, this created a different legal configuration in relation to this important sector of the economy between the border regions, the Soviet border regions in, in Central Asia, and the Soviet border regions in the Far East. The biggest obstacle to the Akospo attempts at creating a Soviet-wide legal market for opium were, were not uh, the bandits or, 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 the, uh, or outlaws in the borderlands, but were regional state institutions that had a vested interest in that the cross-border opium market would remain in a gray area, unregulated, allowing a profitable business with Japanese imperial institutions in this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating. We have some some minutes for questions. Just uh, raise your raise your hand, and um, we are streaming and recording. So if you want to identify yourself, you know, identify yourself. If, if not, that that's that's fine as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm Tom Simons. I'm a retired diplomat. Trained as a historian. How did it all end? <laughs> <laughs> did it end? <laughs> um, um, it didn't. It didn't end. Uh, open production went on. Legal open production in the Soviet Union. Uh, this huge um, uh, sub horse, this state farm, existed until the end of the 1970s right. in, in Kyrgyzstan, and then was closed. Uh, I, I I wasn't able to understand to find the I, I didn't study that period so I don't exactly know why it was closed probably because they were importing um, opium for morphine production or other other medicines from abroad perhaps in that period I'm, I'm not sure um, a particle kind of illegal economy around uh, these opium pro producing regions. Um, was maintained, existed also in, after the Second World War, uh, but not really uh, this, not really this cross-border uh, economy. So the cross-border economy really, I think, largely ended um, in the Far East uh, in the 1930s. Because of the 1930s, because of course they deported all the Korean population, mm -hmm. so they 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 destroyed the the, the cross border society basically. There was a militarization of, of the two sides of the borders. The Koreans were uh, were deported. The Chinese were partially expelled. They were especially targeted by anti market measures that started at the end of the 1920s because many of them were traitors, um, and uh, they were particularly targeted during the Great Terror. Uh, unlike the Koreans in the Far East. And so eventually Vladivostok, which was about one third Chinese in the First World War, was 0 0.13 Chinese in terms of population in 1939. Um, so there was no, this cross-border society had died. Uh, the border between uh, Turkestan and, and Xinjiang had a different story. It remained porous until the Sino-Soviet split in 1960. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, opium played a role there, uh, but surely uh, this was was a border that was possible. And uh, it's also interesting that this was the, uh, to my to my knowledge, the only one of the few uh, border areas of the Soviet Union that was not cleansed, ethnically cleansed, uh, in uh, um, in the 1930s, because this Taranchi community that then was labeled Uyghurs uh, started from the 1930s. Uh, were not deported, they're still there. Uh, and, and also the Huey were not deported because, because again, of, because of the, the geopolitical factor, because the, the, the Soviet Union was uh, hegemonic in Xinjiang in the 1930s. So they didn't, they didn't need to deport anyone. Uh, so that's the, the Cossacks are still there. The Kazakhs were still there. And, and um, I think, I think this fault, I'm not sure about this fault, but in, in any case, there was, there was a, a ethnic transition, so to speak, in terms of labor in, uh, in, in opium production. I, I, I know for sure in Kyrgyzstan, I, I, I don't have precise data for the Jarkent region, but in Karakol, there were mostly Taranchi and, and Huey, who were uh, opium cultivators before the civil war, but in the 1920s, they were already Kyrgyz. Um, so I think that in Kazakhstan, something similar might have happened, even if, even if during the uh, repression of the 1916 revolt, 
uh, Taranjit and Quay have been much more targeted and killed in the Karakol region uh, as opposed to in Jharkhand. So it might be slightly different. But in any case, everybody in that region were uh, linked to the uh, to the opium uh, opium production, and the Kazakhs and Kyrgyz were very much active in uh, uh, in, in smuggling not only of opium across the border. So I've studied um, records in the district archives in in Jharkhand and in uh, Karakol, and uh, since the, the late 1900s, you, you see uh, Kyrgyz smuggling a lot of different things, including corals uh, across the mountains into into, into Xinjiang. The Korean, just to follow up, um, and the deported Koreans from the Far East, were they in any way involved? Involved in opium production in yeah. Central Asia? Yeah. I don't think so. They were mostly uh, involved in uh, rice production. Uh, so uh, it, it's also interesting, uh, this is side story from, from the opium story, but uh, <clears throat> there were experimental uh, rice production uh, collective farms right in the, at the end of the 1920s, where Koreans were settled from the Far East in the Sirdaria uh, Valley in Kazakhstan, uh, because they wanted to, the Soviet wanted to expand rice production in Central Asia. So they brought Koreans for that, for that reason. And, uh, and so this has a lot to do with the decision of the port and the Koreans there, not with the decision of the port and the Koreans at all, but to where uh, to the destination of the deportation, I think it, it has it was connected. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, but I might be wrong, but I, I, I haven't found any documents showing that the Koreans were involved in open production in Central Asia. Thank you so much for this talk. I have one really small question and one slightly lar larger question. The small question is just my own ignorance about um, poppy cultivation. Is it an ongoing uh, crop or are there a certain number of crops per year? I'm, I'm thinking, the reason I'm asking is I'm thinking about the, the fluidity of this traffic and how much it's dependent on something as simple as a as number of crops per year. Right. So then, and then my big, bigger question has to do with um, you're, there was this idea that you um, introduced in the beginning, I, Lauren Benton's, I think, of um, a stable spatial order. And as I listened to your talk, I was thinking about, you know, how useful it is to think about stable versus unstable or instable spatial orders. But you, I think, in your talk made clear that that isn't quite enough, that we also need to build in co the concept of functionality and dysfunctionality, I think. So an instable or unstable spatial order can actually be quite functional, right? In terms yeah. of a cross-border economic exchange, right? Whether or not it's in the interest of a state or not, it can be quite functional. So when we're thinking about defining what a gray zone is, it seemed to me that there's this pairing of the variables of stability and functionality. And then I just wondered what you thought of that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, in terms of crops, um, I think it varies in, in different regions. So there might be re re regions where there it's uh, um, there are two crops per year, but uh, in in Central Asia, uh, um, as far as I know, there is one crop. There was one crop per year around the same time as the grain crop, so August September, and so it was in competition with uh, with grain, even if. Uh, could be could be cultivated in on 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 um, on the terrains on you know, on land which is was slightly different. So, for instance, in in the Jharkhand region, there was cultivation of grain in the in the lowlands and on the hills there was there were there were stripes where uh, poppy was cultivated. Uh, in terms of um, a st a stability and functionality. Um, when I was mentioning the stability, but I totally agree with you. Um, when I was mentioning the instability of the spatial order, I was referring to the fact that the different regions became were conquered um, by by different empires over time. So the fact that uh, Japan was the paramount power on the in the Russian party until 1922, at least in the, in the south, but uh, earlier. Uh, so in that sense, it wasn't unstable because and it was unstable in the sense that, as I said, that the, the Tsarist uh, um, administration was. Uh, planning to be hegemonic and even to conquer Manchuria in the future. And they were there for five years, occupying Manchuria uh, between the Boxer Rebellion and, and the, and the defeat with Japan. So unstable in that sense, in the pure kind of geopolitical or, uh, or military occupation sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and last question. Hi, I'm here. I have a comment and a question. Um, part of my comment, I think that although Turkestan was like a concrete administrative entity in the Russian Empire, when you talk about it within the context of Xinjiang, I think it might be helpful to specify like Russian and Western Turkestan, just because Turkestan was also used within Xinjiang locally and globally this time. Then my second, uh, then my question is, um, as far as the uh, Manchuria trade goes, you talked about uh, 
campaigns against uh, local opium production in Sichuan and parts of China. I know that the British were really emphasized heavily because they viewed local opium production as a threat to their uh, guaranteed rights to import uh, opium from India. I'm curious if there's any like British uh, kind of like knowledge of what's going on here or any concerns that this is threatening their monopoly. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the British, um, so, so before 1908, um, I'm not sure. I mean, the British had a consulate in, in, uh, in Harbin. And so uh, there, there are, uh, I, I worked in the National Archives and there are reports about banditry, especially. We're not so much concerned about opium in that region, but also because Manchuria was not the main market, right? Yeah. So the, the coasts were the main market. After 1908, of course, after the, the 10 year agreement, uh, the British were uh, sent uh, these. Uh, mixed commissions to, to, to check the op that opium was, was eradicated in, in the different regions of China. So uh, definitely uh, they were they were they were uh, involved in checking that, but not so much because they were defending their monopoly, because they were uh, checking that the the opium was being phased out uh, in, the, in the in the production, uh, and this was a very surprising success, right? Uh, that this this um, agreement uh, went through and was successful. Um, and then the British uh, also were monitoring opium trade into Xinjiang in the 1920s. I also worked at the uh, India office uh, records. Um, and um, uh, because, uh, so the, the, the agreements, the opium agreements were included in the, um, in the treaties creating the League of Nations. Soviet Union was not part of the League of Nations, but Soviet Union signed a, a, a treaty with uh, a trade treaty with uh, the UK at the beginning of the nineteen twenties, and the treaty uh, specified that the Soviet Union was bound to apply the obligations towards opium uh, opium trade uh, that were that had been signed uh, in in, uh, in, the, in the Hague uh, at the beginning of the nineteen tens, and therefore uh, that's why the. Um, uh, British consuls were monitoring uh, monitoring this trade, and they were highlighting the fact that the local Xinjiang administration is very much involved in uh, um, in the in the trade. Uh, we it's, it's likely. I mean, it, it's it's a, it's a, it's an open question to what extent, but uh, it's, it's likely. Uh, so uh, yes, the the short answer to your question is that British were uh, uh, collecting information. Um, sending information, but uh, um, in the in the in the 20th century, not because they were um, defending their monopoly, monopoly, but the, because of the of this peculiar of this new phase of this internationalization of of uh, the uh, of anti opium policies that uh, started at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause. Yes. Thank you.